So thanks everyone for, uh, for joining today. My name is Peter Wicklevin. Uh, I'm a senior program manager in the Windows Virtual Desktop team. I'm originally from the Netherlands, uh, so, woo, so it gives me great pleasure to stand here and present, present in front of you. So we're going we're gonna to talk about Windows Virtual Desktop, of course. We're going to talk about what's new in Office, the optimizations we've made. Uh, we recently made some great uh, announcements that I'm going to discuss. Um, so yeah, let's just kick off. So as you heard in many, many of not just the Microsoft presentations, but in general, work is no longer a location. Not every worker sits at a desk or has access to even a company-owned device or sits in a secure location. And one of the ways to solve for that is by using virtualization. And this is what we've been hearing from you. So we've been having a lot of customer conversations and with partners, and we've been asking, where do you use virtualization? And this is typically what we keep on hearing. So I'm not going to show, I'm not going to go into depth onto all of these examples, but let me just pick a few, which, which I think are interesting. So on the left side, you can see specific verticals or industries. So there's financial services that typically like to virtualize because of the clear data separation. Data doesn't end up on the local device, it just remains on the server side. Healthcare, also in the Netherlands, almost 100% is using virtualization. It's just a common, commonly used technology. And the same thing with government. Also here in the Netherlands, it, it applies a lot. They're using uh, virtualization quite a bit. The second pillar is all about being elastic. So how can you make sure you just scale up and down your business in an easy way? Think about seasonal workers. If there's a specific season, you can just scale up and down with just a few mouse clicks, hopefully. Then if you look at the specific employees, uh, education is an interesting one. You have students that just come in with Android, iOS, Windows, you, you name it. They, they bring in everything. And how do you make sure you give them access to a, a standardized workplace without having to worry too much about the endpoint they're using? The last category, category I personally find the most interesting, and it's all about specialized workloads. So one is legacy apps. How can you just modernize an endpoint while still having access to maybe a legacy app, why don't you just virtualize that thing and you can use Windows 10, you can use Office Pro Plus, always up to date, while still having access to that legacy application. Another one, design and engineering. If you go back into time, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, we already had virtualization, we were using it. But just the idea that you could use 3D intense applications in a virtualized environment. That was something we couldn't dream about. And now also, with, even with Azure, we have the end series of uh, VMs. They have dedicated GPU cards. So you now you can just virtualize. You can have a thin client even, or a, a very thin device. And just like you see the guy on the picture, he's just roaming around a factory floor or whatever he's doing. And he can use a 3D intense application, which is pretty cool, right? So we introduced in 2008, in, um, uh, during uh, 2018, during Ignite, we announced Windows Virtual Desktop. And we made a few promises. And during the initial announcement, and now when we have public preview, who heard about the fact that we have public preview starting today? Okay, it's like 25%. So for the other 75%, today it's a great day because we just opened up for public preview. So thank you. Thank you. We've been working very hard to get to this stage, so thanks for those who are clapping. So as a matter of fact, as soon as this session ends, I want everyone to go home or to the office and just start deploying WVD, okay? No, let's not do that. But anyway, one of the things we did add, um, let's go through them one by one. You can see at the top, one of the promises we're making is we deliver a multi-session Windows 10 experience. And we'll go into more depth on what that means. We also enable optimizations in Office, and there's two ways of doing that. One is we acquired an organization called FS Logics, and we're also making uh, optimizations in the product itself, in Office. We're going to depth uh, at the end or towards the end of this presentation. Another thing we kept on hearing is customers saying, well, WVD, Windows Virtual Desktop is great, but we, right now we have an on-premise server virtualized environment 
And we want to either lift and shift that to Azure first, or we want to lift and shift or, or re-platform into a newer Windows Server operating system running on Azure, and maybe later we want to go to WVD or to the multi-session capability of Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, so they would like to use it as a stepping stone. And we enabled some of the, the licensing entitlements, which I think you will like, um, to do that. Now, and because it's hosted on Azure, you can just deploy and scale in minutes. I'll show you in a few slides on how easy it is to deploy your initial Windows Virtual Desktop host pool. So what are the additional benefits of uh, Windows Virtual Desktop? Well, first of all, it's a VDI and RDSH management as a service on Azure. So VDI, Virtual Desktop Infrastructure, that's the model where we typically describe uh, if there's a one-to-one -one mapping between a user and a virtual machine. Could also be a physical machine, but for simplicity's sake, let's say it's a VM. So if you run an organization with 1,000 employees, you need 1,000 virtual machines. And uh, which, it could work great, but there is also a cost implication. It's a quite expensive model. RDSH, Remote Desktop Session Host, is more about multi-session. So you have one virtual machine where you can have multiple people remote into. And both of these things are now supplied as a service on Azure. We offer you both uh, desktops or remote apps or both. It's up to you. You can do pooled, non-pooled, VDI, RDSH, remote app, just full desktops. Everything's included in the service. An additional benefit is Windows 7 ESU, Extended Security Updates. As you know, Windows 7 will go out of support in January 2020. Um, we've been talking to a lot of customers. Most of them, they're already well on the way to the migration to Windows 10. However, if you run out of runway, so you need additional time in order to migrate Windows 7 to Windows 10, there's two options. Uh, Microsoft will have a paid offering for on-prem Windows 7, uh, and uh, so we'll have a specific price for the first year, the second year, and the third year, so you can have three years of extended security updates, which we charge for, um, or you upload that Windows 7 workload into Azure and we'll throw in that three years of extended security updates free of charge. Do we want you to use it? No, we'd rather not. We'd rather have you migrate to Windows 10. But if for whatever reason that doesn't work out, this could be an option for you. We're, one of the cool things that I like about this, uh, this product and this service is the fact that we're using Azure AD uh, identities to remote into the service. I'll explain a bit more what that means. Um, but it just means that we can uh, use all of the M365 security capabilities and all the management tooling that we have, and that will just integrate nicely. So if we dive in a little bit more, if we look at the high-level architecture, how Windows Virtual Desktop is designed, um, you can see the, the three sections on the right. So let's start at the bottom one, the one that says Managed by Microsoft, and it tells you Compute, Storage, and Networking. That's just Azure Infrastructure as a Service, nothing new. So we'll abstract all of the networking components, the storage, the, the CPU, etc. All of the hardware is managed by Microsoft. On the top right, you can see the, the six boxes that say Web Access, Management, Diagnostic. Those are typically the roles if you spin up your own on-premises RDS environment. That's what you need to install, right? You need to purchase hardware, you need to install Windows Server, you have to install these roles, you have to domain join them, you have to manage them, you have to expose them to the internet. Uh, potentially, you need to troubleshoot, and there's a lot of moving wheels. All of this as a service managed by Microsoft. Now, there's also a section in between, and that's in your subscription, your control. Also, when, uh, when we designed the service, we were talking to customers, and we talked like, how, how would you like us to do that? Would you like us to take ownership of the virtual machines so we abstract that from you? Or do you want to remain in control? And that's the second thing is what we chose. So that means the virtual machines that you have access to through that management plane, the top six boxes, are running in your Azure subscription. That means you can use uh, like ExpressRoute or VPN just to connect 
to your uh, virtual machines. You can manage them with Config Manager. Uh, we have Intune support as well, but it's up to you. You can customize your image, you can upload it to Azure and deploy it, whatever you, whatever you want, it's fully flexible. So instead of just talking about it, let's just, um, let me show you what it looks like if you want to do an initial deployment. So for this, I'm going to switch to the, um, the Azure portal. And starting today, if you go to uh, create a resource, if all goes fine, if the internet is working, we're going to search for Windows Virtual Desktop. And starting today, you will have this entry over here. So this allows you to provision your first host pool. And what is a host pool? It's a pool of hosts that typically offer one and the same service. So you could create a, a, a host pool of maybe five virtual machines that offer remote apps, or another host pool that has five virtual machines that delivers full desktop experiences. It's up to you. So the first time when you go in here, you select Create. And you're presented with this six-step wizard. But to, to be honest, it's really four. So we have to supply some credentials. We have to supply the name of our host pool. And let's just quickly go through this so you get an idea on what kind of information is wanted. So first, you have to provide the host pool name. And by the way, can you read this in the back? Can you maybe someone raises his hand if you can read it? Okay, all right, looks about, looks about right. So I'll just punch in some details like uh, Amsterdam pool. You can select what kind of, uh, whether it's a pooled or personal, and then we supply which user we want to assign. So I'll just do user1 at wvdcontoso.com. We select what kind of subscription we want to deploy to and we need to create a empty resource group. So this is nothing new. In Azure, you have this concept of a resource group that combines resources. Um, let's just say uh, the same thing, oh, maybe not this. Let's say Amsterdam. We supply the location and hit OK. The next thing, we can select what kind of uh, virtual machines we want to spin up. And this is also something, talking to customers and partners, they told us we want to have the full flexibility of selecting what kind of VM we want to spin up. We don't want to have this t-shirt size selection of light, medium, or heavy. We'll provide some guidance. So here you can say, well, I want to have like a light or medium, and I want to have maybe just 10 users. And based on that, we're, we'll change the guidance or the suggestion of what kind of virtual machine we think you should be running. But if you disagree, for whatever reason, you can just hit change size, and you can select every virtual machine that Azure has to offer, including the N series that contain the dedicated GPU card if you want to do full 3D modeling or run some 3D intensive application. So for now, I'll just select whatever, the A2, I can add a prefix if I want and go into the next step. So here we have a few options. What kind of image you would like to deploy? So we can either go for the gallery, and right now we have Windows 10 Enterprise multi-session that I'll talk about later. You can select Windows Server, and soon we'll also have Windows 10 multi-session with Office Pro Plus included in the gallery over here. Now, one of the, the common questions is, this is great, but what about my own image? I have my own customized image with my LOB apps. Well, the great news is you can upload that to Azure, just put it in some blob storage, get the or copy the URI, punch it in here. So if I select blob storage, I can punch in the, uh, the, the image URI, and Windows Virtual Desktop or this wizard will just pull that image and then just deploy it to the VMs you specified. Now, we have to um, punch in some credentials about the AD join. So the thing I just mentioned, remember when I, when I said the cool thing is we'll remote into this service or we'll connect into this service with Azure AD identities. And that's awesome because we can just enable conditional access and multi-factor authentication 
all of the cool things that N365 has to offer. But the other thing that customers want is just traditional domain joint virtual machines. We also support Azure AD in the near future, but a lot of the legacy applications, they require traditional domain joint virtual machines. So what we'll do is we'll broker that connection into Azure, and then we'll give you single sign-on access to just a regular AD joint virtual machine. So we have to enter some credentials to make sure that virtual machine is joined to the domain. And let's do admin, uh, a password. Then we'll have to do some networking. And this will just make sure that when those virtual machines are spun up, they can find the domain controller or uh, ADDS in order to join it. Select the subnet and hit OK. I forgot something. Ah, oh, OK. Let's go back to the, the gallery. So the last step in this wizard now is um, I have to supply information about my Windows virtual desktop tenant. And let's spend 45 seconds to explain what that means. Within your Azure subscription, you know, you can have multiple Azure AD tenants. You can have the same thing with Windows virtual desktop tenants. So if you want to deploy multiple, it's, it's possible. If you're a hoster, you could even create for every customer, create a different tenant or tenant group. So here we specify details on which one we want to deploy resources into. So I'll just enter something. Uh, you have to enter credentials again and hit OK. And that was the last step. So now if everything goes well, it will run some validation and we'll hit OK. And the next thing is that we'll only have to hit Create. From that point on, my virtual machines will be deployed. There is an agent installed on those virtual machines. Those will create an outbound connection using port 443 TCP into Azure. And then whenever someone connects, we'll just broker that connection. So Azure, you could see Azure as your reverse proxy. So also on the virtual machine itself, you don't need any inbound ports being opened. So there's no TCP 3389 anymore that needs to be opened. It's only outbound 443, which I think is pretty neat. So this is um, you know, how you deploy your first Windows virtual desktop host pool. And like mentioned before, the only thing we need to do is hit create and off we go. So going back to this picture, um, in your subscription, your control, you can see we have Windows 7 Enterprise. We'll support that as well, together with the extended security updates. We support Windows 10 Enterprise if you are interested in VDI. We have Windows Server 2012 R2 and up. Um, you can offer remote app or full desktop. And then there is this new thing, the Windows 10 Enterprise multi-session. So let's spend a minute talking about that. So up to this point, if you wanted to virtualize, you had two choices. You can see on the left, Windows Server, and Windows Server has some benefits. The biggest benefit is that it contains mult or support for multiple sessions. So multiple people can remote into one virtual machine running Windows Server, which gives you a specific cost advantage. Now, it only runs Windows 32 applications, no modern apps, no store, Cortana, Edge. Um, typically, it's used with Office Perpetual, and it's based on LTSC, long-term servicing channel. The problem with that is that there's no real innovation in the platform itself. Security updates, of course, but no new security features. Like on Windows 10 client, uh, we constantly just introduce new optimizations specifically for security. Um, and just the whole landscape around us is changing. So having an operating system that is static for 10 years is not always a great combination. On the other side of the spectrum, you can see Windows 10 Enterprise, which has a lot of other benefits, like it has Win32 uh, and modern app support. Uh, it's optimized for Office 365 Pro Plus, so that gets monthly feature updates. It runs on the semi-annual shadow cadence, so twice a year you'll get feature updates. What we've been working on is combining the best of two worlds, and that's by using this Windows Virtual Desktop multi-session capability. So it looks, it feels, it smells like Windows 10. It allows multiple sessions, so multiple people can remote into it. You have great Win32 support. 
Um, we support Edge, Cortana, Store, you name it. Optimized for Office 365 Pro Plus, and we'll go into more details on what that means. And you can use feature updates twice a year. We'll also have the release that's supported for 30 months. So we encourage you to, uh, to update twice a year, but it's not mandatory anymore. So let's just talk about why people want to have session-based virtualization. And I already mentioned that uh, cost is a very, very big reason why to. So this is um, a scenario we see used a lot. So on the bottom, you can see a user. You can see the virtual machines. So this is the VDI scenario. So every user has their own virtual machine. Every virtual machine runs Windows, so it has the overhead of the operating system. And you can see some resource utilization. And it's very similar if you're going to a random meeting at your organization, everyone has their laptop open, and I bet that 90% of those devices are just idle. Unless you're furiously taking notes, most of the machines are just idle most of the time. And specifically in the cloud, we care about that because you could be charged even though you're not using all of those resources that you assigned. So in this scenario, we have five users. Uh, each of them have two vCPUs and either four or potentially eight gigs of RAM assigned. Um, now, if we just scale this up, so let's imagine uh, instead of those, those five, you run 24 of these task workers. If you want to assign each of them one of those virtual machines, it means you require 48 virtual CPUs and 96 gigs of RAM, which is substantial. Now, if you, uh, if you move to the multi-session capability, things change slightly. You can see there's still a lot of white space where you're potentially paying for. So if we change to multi-session, we can jam all of these users into one box, into one virtual machine. And that thing will be, will be beefier, of course, but we can host 24 users easily on a multi-session operating system. So in this case, we can reduce to just eight vCPUs and 32 gigs of RAM, which just saved us, saved us over 24 virtual machines and an 80% uh, total amount of resources. So this is why we think that session-based virtualization could be a great fit, not for all scenarios, but for uh, maybe the majority of them. Now, we've talked quite a bit about Windows Virtual Desktop. Maybe we should just show something. We just deployed our first host pool. Now, let's see what the end user experience is like. So here we are. This is right now what you're looking at is just my physical device. So this happens to be a service laptop that I have over here. Um, and what we have, and by the way, who attended Scott's Manchester mechanic session, which was just like an hour ago? Okay, I'd say 25, 30%. A few people here in the front, like the hardcore fans, you were there, right? Waiting all day. Um, so what Scott showed as well is this client that we introduced. So it's a remote desktop client, it's a Win32 app, and it runs on Windows 7 uh, or pretty much any supported Windows operating system. So you can, as an IT app, and you deploy this, the end user subscribes to a feed one time, so that means they have to enter their credentials once. We play nice with things like federation, and from that point on, you'll get a list or a feed of all the applications and full desktop sessions that you are assigned. So in my example, if I just zoom in a bit, you know, I got a, a, a few of these remote apps, and I got over here, I have one full desktop experience. What's even cooler on Windows 10, because we have clients for all operating systems or all major operating systems, we have in the store for Android, I'll, I'll show you soon, we have one for Android, uh, we have an HTML5 client, which should be open here as well. <clears throat> so even if, I don't know, you're at the airport, uh, you're just going to a random kiosk. You can also just, without installing a client, just go to the HTML5 client, authenticate, and you can run full desktops or remote apps, even in full screen, without using a client, which is pretty neat. Now, with Windows 10, we can get a great experience because it also integrates with the Start menu. So you can see these apps, and if I just hit my Start menu and I scroll down a little bit, I have the same thing, the same applications over here. So as an end user, I don't even have to know about a separate client being deployed. 
I can just search in my start menu, and I don't even have to know that I'm running a virtualized application. So the integration is quite nice. So let me show you what happens if I launch an app. So let's go for Word, for example. And here it launched, and keep in mind, by the way, that this is running, so you're only looking at the output. The application itself is hosted on a virtual machine, which is in the US right now. So every pixel on the screen is traveling from here, using this, this dodgy Wi-Fi, all the way to the US and back, and displaying on my screen. So once we, uh, once we go GA with Windows Virtual Desktop, we'll deploy uh, the management plane to different regions as well, which means that the performance will be a lot better, because the traffic doesn't have to be routed all the way uh, across the globe. But even if, you know, even taking that into account, the performance is pretty good. And the only way to really tell that we're looking at a remote app is by looking at this thing over here. This cliff, that's how it's called. I just learned that the other day. This cliff is what shows it's a remote app. From an end user perspective, we can do the same things, you know, you can, um, Let's open another one. So here I have Notepad, for example, that says, hello, Amsterdam, isn't that nice? And we can snap, just like a normal Win32 application, we can snap it to the side. Um, we can even copy and paste stuff across. So if I, you know, say test, or you can put it in here, it just behaves and feels like a locally installed application. So that's the remote app scenario. What about the full desktop experience? So I've already opened the full desktop experience. So that's the same thing as just clicking this icon over here. And if all goes well, we should be connected to our Windows 10 multi-session operating system. Now this is gonna be a pretty boring demo because it's just like a Windows 10 PC. If all goes well, you shouldn't really notice any difference. The only real way to tell it's a different um, multi-session capability is by looking, if we launch Task Manager, you can see that we have a bunch of users, let me just zoom in for the people in the back, uh, a bunch of users that are currently connected. It's not too much to be honest, it's me, I'm user 300, and there is another one, another person called SSA, and then a few users connected but just disconnected their session. Question we get a lot, how many users can you host on one Windows 10 multi-session um, uh, operating system? And the answer is we have no limit. It depends on what kind of virtual machine you assign, how beefy that virtual machine is, how much vCPUs, how much memory, but we didn't design for any, any specific uh, number, no, no limit. All right, so multiple people can work on this machine. Typically in virtualized environments, you always had a bit of a compromised experience with Office. Um, one of the problems is, specifically in, in non-persistent environments, let's imagine you have five virtual machines. And every time when I connect to the service, I'm gonna be placed on one of those five virtual machines, and there's no way to predict which one. From that point on, a new, a new session is created, which is almost like a new Windows profile. So just imagine you getting a new physical device every day, you authenticate, and then you have to set up Office, and Office will say, hey, hello, welcome back, or not even welcome back, just welcome. Uh, <laughs> what is your username, your password? It will start downloading your 30 gig of junk or whatever you have in your Office 365 mail. Um, and there's a lot of caching in, in, in Office that you're just missing. One node, it will just, it starts pulling down everything. And in some scenarios, that's not ideal. Just imagine you run the same organization with a thousand employees and a thousand employees start downloading all of their office data uh, at 8 a.m. or 8.30 in the morning. So that's why we have FS Logics technology and I'll explain soon how it works, but let me just show you that the end user experience, and that's our goal, is just like a physical device. So I have office opened, I can search in it, um, I think one of my friends invited me for uh, some poker, which was a few days ago, I wasn't there. But anyway, you can see Search just works, which is always in uh, a virtualized environment was always a bit, uh, a bit difficult to achieve. So Outlook just works. The other thing which is nice is OneDrive. <coughs> OneDrive normally is not supported in a virtualized environment. Using FS Logic technology, 
This just works. So you can see I have my files here. And you can even just size the data disk for a user relatively small and use the feature or the files on demand feature of OneDrive. Since this is a virtual machine running in Azure, my data for, One, for OneDrive for Business is also in Azure. So that means that if I want to get a file across, it's pretty quick. As a matter of fact, I think we can, we can leverage the, 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 um, the internet speed of Azure in multiple ways. Let me show you another thing. So what I'm going to do is just open a browser, and uh, let's just put this on the left side. And I'm going to open a local uh, browser session as well. So what you're looking at on the left side is just Edge running on my normal device here. It's connected to the, to the Wi-Fi. On the right side, you can see this is Edge running in my virtualized environment. Now, let's do a speed test. So if I go to fast.com and I do the same, Azure always has to get warmed up a little bit. So on the left side, you can see I'm browsing with 16 megabytes per second, while on the other side, we're going towards, well, if you wait long enough, hopefully we'll show something in the order of one gig. So just imagine I'm traveling with maybe a 3G or a 4G dongle, and if I open my Edge in a remote app or a full desktop experience, I can browse pretty quick. That's nice, isn't it? All right, so let's get back to the presentation. So how do you deploy? Well, you've seen the initial marketplace deployment. That's one way of doing it. Um, we also have ARM templates um, that are hosted on GitHub. So if you either want to do it, I'd say manually one time, if you just want to kick the tires, you want to see what the service is like, go to the marketplace. If you want to do more advanced things, maybe spin up a larger environment, you could take a look at one of the, the, the ARM templates. In terms of management, we focused initially on uh, automation tools, so scripts, PowerShell, REST APIs. We're also building a native um, Azure portal integration. Scott showed it in his mechanic session. I have a link to his session uh, at the end. It's, I think it's around 15 minutes, 15 minutes well spent. Uh, and that will show you a sneak peek of that environment as well. So when we go GA, we hope to have, or shortly after, we'll hope to have a nice integration with the Azure portal. We also opened up for CSP, which means that we have partners already now that build more uh, additional value around it. So I think that Windows Virtual Desktop is pretty easy to deploy, but we have partners that already worked on this to make it even easier or create additional value around it. So that's another thing you could take a look at. So let's take a look on how you can uh, add or remove a remote app with PowerShell. So for this, I'm going to open up my uh, PowerShell uh, ISE. And the only thing I've done before I started my presentation is I've run these commands. And the only thing it does is um, it connects to Azure, it authenticates, I, uh, you know, it throws up a password dialog, and, and that's the only thing I've done. Now, from that point on, you can do a few things. You can see which applications are offered, and you can also publish a new remote app. So before doing this, let me show you one thing. If you look at my, the remote apps that are currently offered, so right now we have a total of seven apps, right? Seven apps, one desktop. If I go back to my PowerShell command, and I just gonna, I'm going to execute this one command, and it says, publish this thing, I mean, how can you live without? Calculator. So let's execute, or oh, maybe I should select that row first. Let's execute, and if we go back to our client, and if we hit update now, if all goes well, this thing goes to eight apps and just one desktop. So now you can see here, we have our friend calculator being published. Pretty easy, right? So we have PowerShell commands that's available, we have REST APIs, so you can just integrate it with ServiceNow or one of your automation tools. Now, of course, you can do the same with removing, but I'm sure you kind of believe that that thing just works.
Let's switch to office improvements. So who heard about our FS Logics acquisition that we did? Okay, so we're looking at maybe 50%. So we did this back in November, and we've been working since to integrate it into Windows Virtual Desktop. And it's pretty cool technology. They have three or four products, depending on how you look at it. They have one thing that's called the Profile Container. The way it works is, normally, if you have Windows, and if you would browse to see users and your username, anything underneath, so your whole profile, is just stored locally. All your files and your cookies and everything that belongs to you is stored in that profile. What the Profile Container does is it allows you to create a VHD or a VHDX that is stored outside of the virtual machine, and that contains your profile. Now, whenever you authenticate to the service, you will be assigned to a random uh, host in the pool. And what the FS Logix technology does, it mounts that VHDX. So just before you log on, or slightly after you log on, it mounts that VHDX to see users, your username. So Windows thinks that it's just reading and writing to your local, local drive, while in reality, it's a VHDX file, which is outside of the virtual machine itself. And that gives us some benefits, um, like Office, all of the Office cache, like the global address list, and your OneNote, and your OST, everything, everything stored on that profile. So that solves pretty much all of the, the Office compromised experiences that we had in the past in a virtualized environment. Now, some organizations already have a profiling solution, but they don't have a solution for the, specifically the Office 365 problems. You can also just use the subset, which we call the Office 365 container in that case. Another great thing is app masking. It allows you, install to, it allows you to install multiple applications in one image, and then they can just mask specific apps. So you can make just on the fly apps visible and enable them to specific groups. So theoretically, you could just install all applications into one image. That would be a horrible design, by the way. But you could theoretically just install everything in one image and then just almost like whitelist or make apps available to specific groups. The last piece of technology is Java redirection. And that allows you to have multiple versions of Java installed on one VM and then just make specific versions available to specific apps or URLs. So all of this will be embedded with the Windows Virtual Desktop uh, offering. Now, I mentioned in the beginning that we're we made some changes or we made some decisions on how we're going to make this available to partners and customers like yourself. And I think that's great news. If you specifically look at the FS Logix technology, as long as you're licensed for one of these uh, offerings that you can see on the slide, uh, you have access to FS Logix technology. So I'm not going to go through the full list, but you can see, just to summarize, the, the M365 offerings that are on the list, the Windows 10 offerings, those are all per user. Uh, we have one specifically if you don't have Windows endpoints or primary Windows endpoints. And then the, the, another cool thing, which I think you will like, it's also with RDS CALs. That means... That means you can use this on-premises as well. If you're using Windows Server 2008 R2 and up, you can use FS Logics technologies as long as you have an RDS CAL. Now, this is great for, for many reasons. Uh, one of them also is that if you decide to use the profile technology, that VHDX file that I was, was uh, explaining about, if you ever decide to go into the cloud, use Windows Virtual Desktop in the cloud itself, you can easily migrate those profiles. You can either upload them. We even have uh, cloud cache technology that allows to kind of replicate it into the cloud as well. So your profile migration is relatively easy. OneDrive for Business also made a lot of uh, innovations. Um, the short summary is everything just works. It will sync in non-persistent environments. We offer the co-authoring capabilities. We'll have uh, on-demand. Uh, you can also automatically populate all of the user profile folders. You know that a lot of end users, they place stuff on the desktop. Um, and typically, that didn't use to sync with OneDrive for Business. It does now. OneDrive per machine installer, specific optimization for virtualized environments. So if you have 100 users, 
typically you would have 100 instances of OneDrives, just the executable. If there was a new version, all of those 100 would have been updated. Now we just have one installer. It spawns multiple processes, but if it needs to be updated, it's just that one instance, which makes it a lot easier to manage, less resources being used, uh, including network and CPU, etc. Same thing with Outlook. We're just starting, you know, we're starting to add more innovation, making sure this works great in a virtualized environment. Together with FS Logics, search, I think, is a great one. We have a per user search now that just roams across. So your index just travels with you. So searching in Outlook works like a normal PC. And there's more coming. So we've, we've talked about our partner ecosystem. Citrix is a great partner of us. Um, they will, offering, uh, will be offering day one support as well for Windows Virtual Desktop. We talked about calling it day zero, but then it sounds like an exploit, so it's day one uh, support. We have Cloud Jumper that already is one of our CSP partners. Uh, they are making the deployment of Windows Virtual Desktop even easier. We have Lakeside, PeopleTech, Liquidware, and then ThinPrint, for example, to add additional print capabilities. And then we have a new one on the slide, and it's Samsung. And we, there's, looks like a Samsung employee right there. <laughs> so we've been partnering with Samsung, and we've reached a great milestone. And that's together with their Samsung deck. So let me just play a quick video explaining. Today's digital transformation is driving every employee and every business to go further. So businesses are shifting to a desktop experience that empowers IT and enables employees to be more productive and more secure. But not all employees sit in an office, use only one device, or always work from secure locations. Introducing Windows Virtual Desktop, the full Windows experience virtualized in the cloud. Always up to date and available on any device. Optimized for Office 365, so you can deliver the most productive experience to your users. And now, Windows Virtual Desktop gets even better with support for Samsung DeX. Samsung DeX delivers both a phone and a powerful desktop-like experience with a single device. Benefit from a small and big screen experience. Switch from one application to another easily and securely. Unlock mobility, productivity, and security with the Windows Virtual Desktop and Samsung DeX. So we've been uh, working together with Samsung, making sure that you can use, almost carry your PC in a mobile phone factor. Uh, I'll show you a demo soon of what it means, but it allows you to just use Windows 10 and Office 365 Pro Plus uh, using Windows Virtual Desktop on an Android endpoint, which is pretty cool. You can just go up to any big screen, connect the cable, and it's just, the thing I like, it's just a standard USB-C to, for example, HDMI. There's no proprietary docks or anything funky. It's just a new, normal cable you can use. Um, and just imagine the, the potential. As soon as we have, uh, like, 5G or Wi-Fi 6, which the phones are already prepared for, we can just have an amazing experience. And let, you, let me just show you what that, what that looks like. So what I have here in my hands is just a Samsung device. This happens to be a Galaxy 9, but this works on the S8 and S10 as well. So let me just connect this. And like mentioned before, it's just a regular USB-C uh, connector, nothing special. There it is. So it switched automatically to DeX mode, desktop experience. And from this point on, we have access to all Android apps that are available, which is awesome. You can load your applications, you can be productive. But what if you want to have access to maybe uh, a Win32, a line of business applications, uh, application? You can use Windows Virtual Desktop in combination. So what I've done is I brought my mouse, this is just uh, a normal USB mouse. Again, nothing special. I brought a, a, a little Bluetooth-enabled keyboard, which are paired to the phone. And from this point on, I can just launch the RD client. 
and I have access to the same feed of applications that you saw earlier. So I can either choose for apps or full desktop. And in this case, I'm going to connect to my full desktop experience. Now, remember, this is all hosted in the US. So right now, we're connecting here from the dodgy Wi-Fi all the way to the US, logging on or authenticating to my Windows virtual desktop machine. And within a few seconds, we should have access to my, my Windows device. Now, another cool thing which I like about this method is that even though we're connected to uh, DeX and Windows Virtual Desktop, we can still use the phone. So I can make phone calls or be real productive and let my kids play games. Um, but anything you want, you know, it's two separate environments. <laughs> so here, let's just close this, this browser. And uh, we could even, if I go to my OneDrive for Business, Let's see if I pick the right one. So I'm going to load up this PowerPoint presentation. And now we can just continue with the presentation on using my phone. So right now, my service device is not doing anything anymore. I could theoretically just shut it down. So we're using the phone, using Samsung DeX. We connect it to my virtual machine that's running in the US. We launched PowerPoint, and if all goes well, now we can just use my Bluetooth keyboard or my mouse, where is it, to just advance with the slides. So let's just continue to use this model. Let's talk about licensing. How do you get access to Windows Virtual Desktop? We discussed the FS Logics technology previously. Now we're looking at Windows Virtual Desktop itself. And again, I think it's pretty good news because the vast majority of the, the larger uh, commercial organizations or even partners, they're already licensed to have access to Windows Virtual Desktop. So you can see it's the same list, M365, E3, A3, E5, I'm not going to name all of them. F1 is an interesting, by the way. Um, then same thing with Windows 10 VDA per user if you're using non-Windows endpoints, um, or if you're using an RDS Cal. So if you have an RDS Cal, you can also have access to Windows Virtual Desktop. Now, depending on the workload you spin up on top of Windows Virtual Desktop, because remember, we support Windows 7, Windows 10, Windows 10 multi-session. If you're doing that, you need one of the licenses that you can see on the top. If you're spinning up a Windows Server, you still need RDS CALs. So it's exactly the same as on-prem. In terms of pricing, so once you have access to Windows Virtual Desktop, the only thing we charge for is just the regular Azure compute, storage, and networking. And we have options available to reduce the prices even more. So one of the great ways of reducing costs is by using the multi-session capability. But on top of that, you can use something which is called reserved instances. If you commit to one or three years, we can give you a discount of up to 72%. And for virtualized environments, I mean, typically you don't run a VM just for a day or a week. Mostly it's for longer term, one or three years. So looking into this option is definitely something uh, we would recommend. Now, if you want to learn more uh, and a call to action, go to aka.ms forward slash WD preview, because today we opened up for the public preview. So hopefully you can uh, start kicking the tires. We will be general available in the second half of this calendar year. Like mentioned before, Scott Manchester did a session just, what is it, almost like one and a half or two hours ago, um, which was in the other room, the mechanic session, which was pretty, pretty cool. The recording is already online, so you can see it here. We have all of the clients available in the stores. The only one which, we're still which we still have in beta is the iOS one. If you want to try that one, follow this link. Uh, you go to this, this test or flight setup, and you'll have access to that client as well. If you want to learn even more, you can visit that aka.ms link for Ignite 2018, and it will just list all of the sessions that are related to Windows Virtual Desktop. And with that, we're going to end. So I thank you very much for your time, and I wish you all a great day.